So thank you, Shubro, uh, for arranging the visit and everything. It's always wonderful to come to Bangalore and to come to ICTS. The campus beautiful. Last time I came here, it was looking like it was going to be beautiful, but it hadn't yet gone to where it is right now. It's, it's amazing. It's uh, wonderful. Uh, so Shubro instructed me to talk about this topic. Uh, it's something that's very close to my heart, so I was very happy to ob oblige when he suggested the title. Uh, um, some recent work that we've done uh, with several people. Uh, Chong Wong is a former student of mine, is a postdoc at Harvard now. So Adam Noham is a postdoc at Oxford. He was a postdoc with us at MIT. Max Metlitsky is a, a new faculty member at MIT. And, oh, uh, this one person, there's an extra comma. So, Jenki <laughs> Ju is a faculty member at UC Santa Barbara. And this is me. Okay. Uh, so, I'm going to talk about a class of phase transitions in quantum magnetism uh, that are beyond the standard paradigm for phase transitions. It's a standard paradigm for phase transitions goes back to Lando and Lando, Ginsburg, and Wilson. You say that there's some phase transition between an, uh, 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 the magnetically ordered phase and a magnetic phase. Then the fluctuations that are responsible for all the critical singularities or the long wavelength and uh, long time fluctuation of the order parameter field. Right? So it's the basic idea, and most important idea in phase transition theory. Uh, over many years now, it's been clear that the paradigm may break, break down at certain quantum phase transitions. These are phase transitions that happen at zero temperature uh, due to quantum fluctuations, as you will see some parameter. Uh, uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, some new progress in this uh, the story of quantum phase transitions and magnets that are beyond the slander ginsburg wilson paradigm. Right. So you know some of the people in the very well, uh, many of the others I don't know at all. So I prepared my talk for a generic audience, right? So if, we, you know, so if you don't understand anything that I'm saying, interrupt with questions, right? Uh, since I didn't know exactly who was going to be in the audience, I didn't try to tailor it to any particular audience. Right? So feel free to interrupt. Uh, I'm, I don't have to get through the full talk. Right? Whatever it is that I get through, that's good enough. So what's enabled all this new progress is, uh, uh, or duality transformations, which are trans, uh, transformation. Uh, so, so let me please say what duality means. So given some field theory, some quantum field theory, uh, perhaps it's a conformal field theory. That's the kind that will be relevant to us in this talk. There may be two different uh, uh, Lagrangians that describe the same conformal field theory, which are related in some weird manner. So that's so. There's two different viewpoints on the same conformal theory uh, based on Lagrangians. Right? So, so that's uh, so, so that concept of duality will be useful. But the perspective uh, that we'll use so these dualities are very familiar both in statistical mechanics, kinetic uh, matter, and in uh, energy quantum field theory. So the perspective that will be useful for us is uh, the one that is familiar from high energy physics. Uh, there's a slightly different perspective, related but slightly different perspective that's common in current spectral physics. That's, that's from that point of view that I'll use this, uh, uh, this concept of duality. And uh, uh, in the last few years, there's uh, many, many dualities of quantum field theories in two plus one space-time dimensions that have been understood. Uh, many of these were discussed here in this very room year and a half back when we had a discussion meeting. Uh, there's been many, uh, tremendous progress in that field in the last uh, year and a half. But many of these dualities are, you know, conjectured. There's no evidence but there's no proof. And uh, uh, unlike in high energy field theory, where people can try to build proofs by actually calculating something in gory detail, let's say using tricks like supersymmetry and so on. In the, in the context that we'll talk about, uh, you, there's no real good calculational method 
to calculate things and prove these dualities, except through numerics. Right? So uh, in the specific context of quantum phase transitions and quantum magnets, uh, some of the recently conjectured dualities can be tested very concretely in numerics. Right? So that's one of the main points that I want to, to emphasize, uh, that I want to emphasize both in our paper and this talk. Okay? Okay, so I'm going to be talking about phase transitions and quantum magnets. So the prototypical system is to think about a square lattice and imagine you have spin half magnetic moments arranged on the square lattice and with, a, uh, um, uh, and with some Hamiltonian. Right? So the simplest Hamiltonian that you can imagine writing is a Heisenberg antiferromagnetic interaction which couples neighboring spins together and point in opposite directions. Right? Uh, but we'll allow more generally to think about uh, the phases and phase transitions of uh, spin half systems on a square lattice. We'll allow ourselves to add all kinds of arbitrary interactions that are short range and that are consistent with the symmetries of this uh, basic Hamiltonian. Namely, the spin rotation invariance, this time reversal, lattice space group, and so on. But any short range Hamiltonian uh, will we'll allow ourselves to think in a space of an arbitrary short range interacting Hamiltonian in this system, okay? Uh, so the usual fate of such a quantum magnet is that it will just follow what this uh, uh, term in the Hamiltonian wants the system to do classically. Uh, the spins will just order into an up-down, up-down pattern right? the, of, of the kind that's shown here. So J is assumed to be positive, so the interaction is antiferromagnetic. And so this is called the nail state. It's the nail antiferromagnetic order. And the snail state breaks uh, spin rotation symmetry because the direction of the spin orientation at each side, pick, you know, it has each, at each side, the spin has to pick an orientation. Right? So spin rotation symmetry is broken. And spin rotation symmetry in the Hamiltonian is an SO3 symmetry, spin rotations. And the SO3 is spontaneously broken for U1 subgroup by this ordering pattern. Okay? So I'm going to be interested in paramagnetic phases, uh, quantum paramagnetic phase. These are phases that don't break spin rotation symmetry, even at zero temperature, because of quantum fluctuations. Uh, and with suitable interactions, uh, once, you know, you, depending on what dot, dot, dots you have, you can drive a phase transition to those kinds of quantum paramagnetic phases. I want to, there's many, many kinds of paramagnetic phases that are known to be possible. So I'm going to focus attention on one particular one. Uh, uh, so that's a phase that's uh, called a valence bond solid. Uh, so, that, so the caricature, the, uh, which captures the essence of this phase, described in this picture. Uh, so we imagine that each spin captures a neighboring spin on one of the four neighboring, uh, separated by a neighbor, uh, you know, one of the four nearest neighbor spins. It captures it and forms a singlet bond. Okay. So this ellipse means that it's up down minus down up over square root two. So it's a spin singlet that lives on that bond. And each spin uh, finds such a partner and forms a singlet bond. Okay? Now this pattern of singlet bonds have to do something and they to cover the lattice up in some way. And we're going to imagine that there's a state, this pattern is simply that these bonds, uh, these valence bond form columns like that. Right? So that's a particular example of a paramagnetic state. So this is the ground state. The ground state wave function in this prototypical, uh, in, in, in this picture, is simply a tensor product of these singlet bonds on each of these bonds on which the ellipse lives. OK? Uh, so this state is separate. Uh, there's, a, there's a ground state, and the excitation corresponding to, correspond to breaking a, a singlet promoting the two spins uh, into a triplet and the, and the triplet propagate in the lattice. And that will cause some energy, which is some non-zero number, so there's a spin gap in the state. Okay? So this state, it does not break spin rotation symmetry. The spin singlet is spin rotation invariant. Right? So unlike the nail state, spin rotation symmetry is preserved, but it does break lattice symmetries. For instance, uh, this pattern is degenerate with another pattern in which I shift all these columns to the right by one. Right? It's also it also breaks lattice rotational symmetry. 
this pattern is the same as what I would get if I, instead of having columns, I had rows, right? Where singlet bones covered vertical bones, every vertical bone in this, uh, you know, uh, every such vertical bone, every such vertical bone, and so on, right? So every other vertical bone is covered by a singlet bone, okay? Uh, so there is a fourfold degenerate growth state associated with the four patterns of lattice symmetry breaking in, in, the, in, in, in this kind of paramagnetic state. And these four patterns of lattice symmetry breaking are captured by a Z4 order parameter. It's like a clock that can point in one of four directions. It's called a clock order parameter. Uh, I'll illustrate that in a minute with some pictures. Uh, uh, so that's the state that we're going to focus on, called a valence bond solid. Okay. Uh, so let's uh, understand this valence bond order parameter a bit more. Uh, let's associate a complex number uh, with this valence bond ordering pattern. So we focus on this site and ask in which direction is the valence bond pointing from this site. It could point in one of four directions. Right? So in this pattern, it's pointing to the right. So we draw uh, an arrow to the right and call that the value of a complex number. Uh, now, in this state, uh, for this site, uh, the valence bond points to the left, and so we draw an arrow to the left. And in the next state, the valence bond points up, so we draw an arrow to the up. And here, it points down, so we draw an arrow down. Right? So the four distinct possible states can be represented by drawing arrows, and uh, the arrows can point in one of four possible directions, right? one of four possible clock directions. That's why the order parameter is a four-fold clock order, order parameter, okay? So I want to think about the phase transition from the nail state, valence, this valence bond solid state, as I tune some parameter in the Hamiltonian. So I should say, and I think I had a comment in some... Uh, so this kind of uh, state was discussed a long time ago in this uh, context and shown to be a reasonable state in, in various mean field theories. But by now, there's very lattice models in which you know exactly with what interaction we'll get into the state, right? Uh, OK. So let's think about the nature of the phase transition between these two states. So both states break symmetry, and both states have very simple caricatures, right? So the nail state, this, this is the caricature. It's a very simple picture. The valence bond solid state, this is the caricature, and it's also a very simple picture. Now, uh, the critical first point to notice is that this break in rotation symmetry, but preserves the lattice rotation or lattice translation symmetry, uh, so long as you combine it with some, uh, for instance, translate by one lattice spacing, and I uh, combine it with uh, an improper rotation of the nail order parameter, right? The nail vector go to minus itself. That's the symmetry of the of the state, right? But uh, there's no lattice translation that will bring back this pattern to itself, right? So, so this state breaks spin SO3 symmetry, but preserves a bunch of lattice symmetries. This state preserves spin SO3 symmetry, but breaks lattice rotation, lattice translation, all these symmetries. And so, it's two completely different order, order parameters for these two states. They're totally related. Both states are broken symmetry states. They're captured by a land of order parameter. But it's two completely different order parameters which have nothing to do with each other, apparently. Okay? So the naive expectation within land of theory is if you, for instance, start, draw down the free energy, or in this case, the ground state energy, a function of the land of order parameters, the naive expectation would be that there is no generically, no direct interface. You could have a first order transition or a coexistence of the two phases, or an intermediate phase with neither order, and so on and so forth. But without some further tuning, you know, to reach a phase transition, usually you have to tune one parameter. Uh, without tuning more than one parameter, Landau would say that it's possible to have a, a second order phase transition. Okay? And that expectation turns out to be wrong. And it's been clear for some time now that there's a possibility of a continuous Landau forbidden phase transition between two phases, each one of which is Landau allowed. Right? 
So in modern kinesmatics, there's a lot of discussion of phases of matter that are beyond Landau theory, like fraction of quantum Hall states and so on. But uh, now we're not talking about phases that are not Landau allowed. Phases are captured by Landau order parameter, right? But nevertheless, the phase transition is not captured by Landau theory. Okay. So what is this theory? Uh, so let me just give you the answer right at the beginning, and then I'll give you some intuition, some understanding of where this answer comes from. Uh, so many years back, a uh, uh, bunch of us came up with a, uh, with a framework to address this question of the snail to BS phase transition uh, and showed it could be second order. And uh, there's a field theory uh, that, that we propose to describe this phase transition. And this field theory, uh, I've just sketched, uh, uh, in, uh, sketched it here. It's written not in terms of either land order parameter, not written in terms of either the nail vector or the VBS order parameter, but instead it's written in terms of weird objects. Right? And so the weird objects are these fields Z alpha, which transform as a doublet uh, in, the, in the spin half representation of SO3. Okay? Now, spin half is not quite an ordinary representation of SO3. Uh, it's, uh, SO3 only has the linear, the regular representation of SO3 or integer spin. Right? Half integer spins are properly thought of as representations of SU2. Right? So what we really have is a doublet under an SU2 uh, global symmetry. Uh, uh, and this doublet is coupled uh, minimally to a fluctuating U1 gauge field, which I went as uh, by the letter B. And then there's some potential for this. Just so this is a 5 to the 4 theory. So, uh, uh, so, so the field content is a doublet, as an SU2 doublet, right? And there's a U1 gauge field. Okay? And then there's some Lagrangian with this field content. Okay? Uh, and the dot 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 means we must allow all allowed local operators that are consistent with the symmetries of the microscopic Hamilton. Okay? Um, so, so these are weird objects. Uh, this uh, a field, this Z alpha, uh, is uh, usually called the spin on. Uh, it transforms into spin half. Uh, but spin half objects don't really exist in the microscopic system. Anytime you make a spin flip or do something else, you always create only integer spin. But nevertheless, the field theory is formulated in terms of the spin of objects. And the price that we pay for allowing ourselves to formulate a theory in terms of spin half objects, which are not natural in the microscopic system, is that we had a them to a dynamical U1 gauge field. So these spin ons, nor the gauge field, really has any meaning or existence in either phase. But they rear their head right at the phase transition. It's weird variables being the useful piece of freedom to describe the phase transition, even though either phase is described in conventional order parameters. Okay? So this theory has a name. It's called the compact CP1 model. Uh, some of you might have heard of CP1 model. Uh, how many of you are field theory type people? I know you are, but uh, maybe just, yeah. So then you may not have heard of the notebook fact of the CP1 model. Uh, uh, but the, the reason for this terminology is not important. This is what we'll call the non compact CP1 model. Uh, uh, the, the, the phrase non compact refers to a particular feature of this Lagrangian, which is that uh, we don't add a certain kind of operator. Uh, that uh, one might normally have, or one should add to the Lagrangian, right? So the term that we do not add, the term that's forbidden, is a term that creates two magnetic flux of B, right? That's what's known as a monopole operator. It's, uh, so in space-time, if you think about configurations of the, uh, the magnetic field, of the electromagnetic field associated with this U1 gate field, in space-time, we allow magnetic field lines to just disappear. Or, or sources or sinks of magnetic field lines. That ordinary electrodynamics, even in two plus one dimensions, doesn't have that feature, right? Uh, no, monopole operators, uh, a monopole is one in which magnetic lines can either disappear or be sourced, right? Uh, so really, 
uh, we would add monopole operators to this Lagrangian, allow this field uh, to not have, to, 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 this, to uh, allow this theory to be such that it can create or destroy magnetic flux at will. But in this Lagrangian, we are, we'll see we not allowed to add monopole operators. Right? The theory, this, uh, the, elect the electromagnetic field associated with this internal gauge field behaves pretty much like the familiar electromagnetism and not having magnetic monopoles. The familiar electromagnetism in, in the situation that we usually observe it. Okay, so the key question to ask, physical order parameters related to the fields uh, in this Lagrangian. Right? So the nail order parameter uh, is not, uh, clearly it's not Z itself, because Z is a spin half object, where the nail order parameter is a spin one object. Uh, this is the dagger sigma Z. So this is a spin triplet operator that you form out of two spin halves. It transforms as a vector under SO3. Uh, so this is my nail order parameter. Now the valence bond solid order parameter is that interesting beast. Turns out it's precisely this monopole operator that I just talked about. It's an object that creates two pi flux in this theory. And this was understood a long time ago uh, 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 by Haldane and by Reed and uh, uh, So this identification plays a crucial role in the formulation of the story. Right? Uh, so the theory is not in terms of the not natural order parameters, but in terms of these objects that carry fractional spin and the associated gauge P. Okay? So this is what we call the deconfined quantum critical point. Uh, it's, uh, it's a critical point, and it, it's deconfined because it involves these weird variables which rear their head just to the critical point, but are confined, just like quarks are confined, away from the critical point. They emerge just at the critical point, useful degrees of freedom. OK, so, so where, where did this come from? Right? So I don't really have the time to explain the details of this story from the, uh, the it's old story. But let me give you the main physics. And that main physics is what we'll need. Right? Uh, I mean, it's actually very, very simple to understand, at least uh, to begin with. Uh, the essential point the topological defects of either order parameter in this quantum system carry non-trivial quantum numbers. Right? So in the nail state, there are defects that are very complicated. There are skirmion-like excitations of the nail order parameter. And these skirmion-like excitations in a lattice model can disappear uh, as a function of time uh, uh, through uh, what's known as a hedgehog event. You should think of a skirmion as something that slip through a lattice placket and just disappeared from your system. Right? So I won't talk about those at all. Those are, uh, uh, I'll talk about something simpler instead. The valence bond solid uh, phase has a discrete order parameter. It's a Z4 order parameter. Now, for any discrete symmetry breaking, the topological defects are domain holes. Right? Uh, an Ising model, when you break the uh, Ising symmetry, the defects are domain walls. Now, if you have a clock symmetry like we have here, so there's many different kinds of domains. You can have this orientation go to that, or this orientation go to this, and those are different domains. And you can orient the domain walls. Uh, and there's a useful notion of an elementary domain wall. The clock angle just shifts by pi over 2. Right? So you go from a columnar pattern to a row pattern. Okay? So that's the minimal change that you make in the orientation, of the clock or the parameter. Now, uh, it, for any E4 order parameter, in addition to these domain walls, uh, what can happen is that four of these elementary domain walls can come together and intersect at a point. Right? So, so I'll call them a Z4 vortex. So what happens in this pattern is that the clock angle rotates uh, by 2 pi as they go around the core of this vortex, this point of intersection. It goes from here to here to there to there. Right? So it looks like a vortex. Okay? Uh, so that's the story for any ordinary Z4 order parameter. But now, if we try to draw a Z4 uh, uh, vortex pattern in this valence solid, then we'll find that this one spin, uh, uh, one lattice site at the core of this vortex, 
which is necessarily not part of this Van's bond pairing process. Right? So remember, the Van's bond solid, each spin had a partner with, two, with whom it was tightly bound to form a singlet. Right? But the act of creating the Z4 vortex leaves behind uh, uh, one unpaired spin. Right? So then there's a dangling spin half moment that's left unpaired right at the core. And that's a, an effect that doesn't exist in an ordinary classical theory of a Z4 order parameter. So there's some, dang, some life, some dangling degree of freedom, and in fact, it's a spin half degree of freedom at the core of the Z4 vortex. Okay? This means that the Z4 vortex is a spin half object, and it has some life, uh, uh, and that will have some impact on the phase transition. Now, to melt the valence mode solid order, we have to proliferate the topological defects. So when topological defects uh, become mobile, you lose the long-range ordering. Uh, in this case, we have to proliferate not just the domain walls, but proliferate the Z4 vortices. Right? So Z4 vortices have to switch around freely for you to be able to get rid of the valence mode solid ordering. That's how you can want to melt the valence mode solid order. But since the Z4 vortices carry mag non-trivial magnetic moment, they carry a spin half, when they proliferate, you necessarily end up breaking some other symmetry. In this case, uh, spin rotation symmetry. Right? Uh, so that's the mechanism to produce a new kind of long-range order by starting with the original range order. Okay? Uh, so that's the physics for why when you quantum melt the valence bond solid ordering, you end up quite naturally in the nth state. Okay? Yeah. That's right. So, so, and for the, the valence bond solid ordered phase, because of the domain will come out of this guy, the energy cost to produce any one of these will be on the system size. And if you have a vortex and an anti-vortex, these lines can start at a vortex and end at an anti-vortex. And the energy cost to separate these will be linear in, in their separation. So it's linear confinement of these guys. But nevertheless, we have to proliferate these objects, despite them being confined, right, despite them costing huge energy, you know, the long distance energy is big. What matters for whether we can destroy this order or not is whether we can get this core energy of this vortex to zero, and then they swim around freely, they destroy the long range valence bond solid ordering. And once it is destroyed, the line tension of these domain walls is also gone. Right? That's the mechanism. Okay? Uh, Okay, so, uh, so the critical theory uh, uh, that this uh, point of view leads you to is to say that it's going to be a theory of the Z4 vortices uh, that, uh, that to obtain the critical theory that we focus on the Z4 vortices and write down a theory of critical Z4 vortices. Okay? Now, if this, instead of a Z4 order parameter, if it had been a U1 order parameter, right, where the clock angle could point anywhere along a circle, uh, right, so then, so you, you can, then of course you, talk, you can talk about vortices, and there's a standard framework in which you can describe the destruction of the XY long range ordering as a proliferation of vortices. And that's uh, perhaps the most famous duality uh, in two plus one dimensional condensed matter physics. Uh, goes by the name of charge vortex duality. I didn't actually prepare any slide on this, but it was invented in the condensed matter context, at least by Anand Das Gupta, uh, whom many of you may know, uh, and Bert Halperin, I don't know, 1980 or 1981. And simultaneously, uh, uh, around the same time, in the high-energy uh, literature uh, by uh, Peskin and uh, other people. Uh, so it's a famous duality, something that's bread and butter in modern condensed matter physics. Uh, very familiar to condensed matter physics, perhaps less so I'm learning in the high-energy literature, but it's becoming familiar to high-energy physics in the last years. Right? Uh, uh, so, uh, but the usual charge vortex duality, and this point of view immediately leads you to this non-compact CP1 model plus appropriate anisotropies. Physically, what's going on is that the Z alpha is precisely 
this Z4 vortex, so the VBS order parameter. And uh, by the usual rule, so this does Gupta happen in duality. These vortices are coupled to a U1 gauge field, and then there's some potential. The only difference from the usual story, Sanan dis described uh, 35 years back, is that the vortices now carry a half degree of freedom. Okay? Uh, okay. So this dual point of view, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's what we first did. And simple thing is what we understood later. Right? But um, everything matches. It's exactly the same theory. Yeah. OK. Uh, this description is great. It's wonderful. And in principle, it's calculable. Because this theory, you can imagine simulating or you can imagine calculating in a large n expansion or an epsilon expansion. Right? It's a run of the mill quantum field theory and calculate with it. Right? But it clearly gives you a mechanism, uh, a, a framework in which you see that a phase transition beyond the standard Landau theory can work out. Right? Even, even without any calculations. Okay? Uh, now, despite that, despite the beauty of this theory, it's still interesting to ask, you know, but how can Landau ever fail? After all, you know, everything has to be given, imagine, in terms of the long wavelength fluctuations of the order parameter fields, even the physics of the topological defects. So standard land fails because it does not take into account non-trivial structure of the topological defects. But can you beef up Landau in such a way that it takes care of these topological defects. Right? So it turns out the answer is yes. So it is a theory that's very interesting for, for some reasons, but it's not interesting from the point of view of calculability. So it's useful for calculation, but it's useful for physical insight. Okay? I'm going to describe that next. Uh, so it's a much more formal description of the competition between the NAT and the VBS sort of parameters. Uh, uh, we imagine doing the following things, right? So the net is a three-component vector, and the VBS order parameter is a complex number, right? It's a, you know, if the VBS order were really a U1 order parameter, it would just be a complex number. Now it's a complex number with some four-fold anisotropy, right? We're going to ignore the four-fold anisotropy. It also has a lot of good evidence, uh, both theoretical and numerical, that it's irrelevant at the critical point, so we'll ignore it and think about it as a U1 order parameter. Right? So the nail the order parameter gives you three real numbers, and the VBS order parameter gives you two real numbers. Combine them into five real numbers. Right? And think of them as a five-component unit vector. Okay? Uh, uh, so unit vector condition is imposed just for convenience, just like uh, it's a hot spin model that you make, uh, just like in talking about, say, the Heisenberg universality class in three dimensions. You can either work with a hard spin model or work with a soft spin model. Here we'll just do a hard spin. Now, and, and then ask what happens if you try to write down a theory for the competition between nail and VBS orders in terms of this five component unit vector. So naively you would imagine that some sort of Figma model that lives in the space of this five component unit vector, which is S4, the four sphere, right? Uh, perhaps with some anisotropy that uh, differentiates the nail directions from the VBS directions. That it's some squashed sphere, right? But you would imagine there's some kind of sigma model. Now that description alone turns out to be inadequate to capture this non-trivial structure of the topological defects. That description alone would be the standard Lando description. So what goes wrong with Lando is captured by a, a, a new term uh, that classically is not allowed, but at the quantum mechanical level, uh, meaning once you include the dynamic order parameter, it's, uh, it's an allowed term in the, in, in the action, and it's known as a West zoom in term. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's complex, it's a very phase like term that you add to the sigma model. And uh, what it is, the following, I, I'll just describe it in words. If you've not seen a West zoom in Overton term before, you won't learn it from this talk. So if you have seen it, this will be a reminder, right? So uh, 
So we imagine that space-time, let's think of space-time as being SP, right? And we imagine space-time as the boundary of some region uh, uh, that it's, uh, uh, that's a boundary, that you extend space-time to, which is three-dimensional, to a four-dimensional manifold, right? And your space-time is the boundary of this four-dimensional manifold, okay? Uh, so then, this wisdom you know, within term, so, so this uh, field gives you a map from S3 to S4, right? So this field, you extend this field 2 to the, to the bottom of this four-dimensional manifold, right? And then this term, uh, this gamma, is the fraction of the volume of, S, uh, of the higher dimensional manifold that... Oh, so this n, n vector uh, will, will, when you map it to the higher dimensional manifold, it will cover some portion of the higher dimensional sphere, right? And what fraction of it it covers is the value of this gamma WZW, okay? Uh, it's very much similar. It's totally, it's a generalization of the Berry phase that you write down in writing down the path integral for spin, uh, for, for a spin half object in zero plus one dimensions, right? It's the same idea that there you say that the, uh, that the path integral, that the action is one half area of the fraction of the unit sphere that's covered by the loop traced out by the, uh, by the unit vector, the three dimensional unit vector that the particle's spin orientation describes. So here it's a generalization of the same thing to this, uh, uh, to high dimensions. Right? So it's probably very poorly explained, but I, you know, if you've seen it before, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Otherwise, you're not going to learn it from this brief explanation. But there's a quantum term, a complex term, right? Uh, 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 it's, uh, it's, a, it's a pure imaginary term, both in real space and in, both in Minkowski's signature and in Euclidean signature. So it's really purely quantum mechanical. Okay? Uh, so this term is crucial to capture the non-trivial structure of the topological defects. Right? It's, it's this term that is a theory different from standard and or theory. Okay? So incidentally, uh, the paper I wrote on the subject I wrote when I was in IASC, you know, 10 plus years back. Uh, this was conceived and finished entirely when I was in IASC. So, okay. Uh, so in this description, uh, uh, you know, in principle, we should add anisotropies to the sigma model as, you know, it, as demanded by microscopic symmetry. It's not really a fully symmetric S4, right? But if it were fully symmetric, then the theory would have an SO5 symmetry it's been all five components of this five component unit vector, right? Uh, now, uh, now, the crucial feature of this Vesumino Witten term is that if you make a vortex in any two components, right, you have these five components. Imagine thinking about a vortex configuration in any two components, right? Then at the core, let's say I put a vortex in N1 plus IN2. Right? Then at the core of the vortex, N1 plus IN2 vanishes, and this five-component vector points entirely in the other three directions. And if I evaluate the Zumino term in, in, in that core, for uh, the, the state of the Zumino term in the core of that vortex, it becomes precisely the spin berry phase for a spin half, uh, the remaining three components, right? which means that this forces a vortex in any two of the components to behave as a spin or under the SO3 symmetry of the remaining three components. Now that's precisely the physics that is described by this picture, right? So we've taken this picture, which is very intuitive, and we've recast it in a very formal language uh, in terms of these sigma models and with zoom in over in terms, okay? Uh, now what this formulation tells you uh, is the first that it's possible to formulate the theory in terms of Landau fields. It still doesn't make it obvious that the transition will be second order, uh, but at least it's possible to formulate it. But the price you pay is this Vesumino written term, which is very unyieldy and not very tractable. Uh, but the thing that this formulation suggests is that perhaps 
at the critical point, uh, there is indeed a symmetry that rotates between these five components and is an emergent SO5 symmetry. Okay? So this was a dream at that time when we and others were writing these papers. It was just uh, rather speculation. Uh, but it turns out now, after many years, that there's very good numerical evidence that there's indeed an emergent SO5 symmetry at this critical point. And that's one of the main things that I'm going to talk about in this talk. Okay, so that's where the theory stood, and that's, uh, that since 2006 or so, on the purely conceptual front, there's not really much progress, but there was a heroic effort by, in, by the numerical community to try to answer this question of whether this land of forbidden phase transition really exists or not. A uh, large number of numerical people involved. Uh, uh, so the current, so here I'm just go, quickly going to summarize the current status of where things stand. So there's good evidence in the numerics that, it, that the NCCP1 model, uh, the, that the continuum field theory that we pose really does describe a transition. Right? Uh, uh, but it's not at all clear, or rather, uh, uh, that's maybe too strong. The crucial question that's not completely settled is whether this model, this continuum field theory, has a second order phase transition. Okay? It's a well-defined continuum field theory, but does it flow in the infrared to a fixed point? Right? So, apparently, yes, uh, but the ultimate fate is not yet settled. Okay? Uh, there's indirect support. You can solve this theory in the 1 over n expansion, and the 1 over n expansion, it certainly flows to a conformal field theory. Okay? So that things are in good shape from the 1 over n expansion. But we're interested directly in NCCP1, and the 1 over n is a guide at best. We can't swear by it. Right? The only way to address small values of n is by doing a direct calculation, and that has to be done numerically. And there, there's many, many people uh, uh, simulating various kinds of lattice models that are expected to be in the same universality class. And the good news that uh, many, all these simulations see what's apparently a continuous phase transition. And furthermore, the exponents that these three different simulations see on completely different lattice models or agree with each other reasonably well. So there's good evidence that some kind of universality exists. Different lattice models have the same behavior. Right? Uh, very, very different looking lattice models have the same behavior. And furthermore, the transition seems continuous. You know, people go to humongous system sizes, you know, 600 cubed, uh, just, right? at least on that system size, it looks continuous. That's the good news. The bad news is that these critical exponents have a systematic drift with system size. It becomes apparent to go to bigger and bigger system sizes. That's not something that expect of an ordinary second phase transition. Okay? Uh, so we don't really know what's going on here. Uh, but we have some ideas, some proposals now, but this is a worry uh, that the exponents are drifting as you increase system size, stabilizing at some particular values. And this very recent new mix by Adam Nahum and his collaborators showing very strong evidence that for the SO5 symmetry that rotates the nail order parameter into the VBS order parameter. In fact, the evidence for SO5 is stronger than the evidence for a continuous phase transition. Right? Uh, this suggests then that maybe there is a critical fixed point, a critical point right, described by continuum field theory with full SO5 symmetry. Maybe that there's a conformal field theory with full SO5 symmetry for which we have some idea, uh, a reasonably good idea of what the critical exponents are. And this kind of thing, uh, there's a new, there's new progress in understanding, or at least in calculating, with conformal field theories in two plus one dimensions, using what's known as the conformal bootstrap. Uh, so, people, the conformal bootstrap people got interested in this question and looked into it. Uh, fortunately, you don't find an SO5 invariant conformal field theory with exponents in the range where the numeric suggests they should be. Right. So the the, the 
Purito is so far symmetric CFT is in tension with existing bootstrap results. Right? A bootstrap is a bit of a black box to me, so I, uh, and to many of the, many of the non-practitioners. So uh, this tell us that such a, they can't find such a CFT. Did they make a mistake, or did they not look carefully enough, or what else is going on? I don't know, right? But different book people agree with each other that this such a CFT doesn't exist. So there is some un, unresolved issue, right? So the this is not completely settled as things stand, and it's a lot more work that needs to be done to clarify the situation. I wish I could give you a more clear story, saying yes, we can declare victory, right? But unfortunately, things are not there, right? Okay. So, so given this situation, I'm going to try and answer at least some questions that uh, in, come to mind. Uh, I won't answer all questions, because I don't think we can even, since we don't know all the answers from numerics or from bootstrap, it doesn't make sense to try and answer all the questions they raise, right? Uh, the, the, a lot of dust needs to settle. But the new numerical thing is the emergence of the SO5. So I want to ask uh, uh, one question is how to think about the emergence of the SO5. And the other is whether there's a field theoretic formulation which has manifest SO5 symmetry. Okay? So I'll address both these questions in this talk. Okay. Uh, so the first question, uh, I'm going to give an explanation for the emergence of the SO5 by proposing a series of dualities involving this field theory, right? the sensei CP1 field theory. If those dualities are correct, then we understand the SO5. And, this, and we'll see to what extent the dualities are correct by trying to build evidence for it from various kinds of arguments. Okay? So let's start with that first one, the story. So I'll just talk with one member of the, this duality. It's so just a proposal. You can ask where it came from. We just invented it. <laughs> just made it up. Right? So maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong. But there's a very clear statement of what we are saying. Uh, so the first statement is that this theory, uh, this non-compact CP1 theory, is self dual okay? uh, so to say it's self-dual, it means that this theory, which is described as this Lagrangian, plus way or all allowed terms, is dual to another theory which has the same uh, structure. There's another field W that transforms uh, as a spin or under something. It won't be the same uh, symmetry as this. And it's also coupled with U1 gauge field. And that these two theories, uh, or the same theory, uh, despite, you know, you might say, look, it's the same Lagrangian, just written with different symbols. So is it non-trivial that it's the same theory? Right? But the way self-duality works is that there's, uh, there's, a, there's a matching of operators between the two sides. It tells you that some operator in this theory is some non-trivial operator on the other side. Okay? So the particular proposal is that operator Z or Z, which is one component of the nail vector. It is uh, uh, nx plus iny. It's one component of the nail vector is dual to the magnetic monopole in the dual operator of the dual theory. Likewise, the monopole operator of this theory is dual to the W1 star W2 operator of this theory. And then the third component of the nail vector in this theory, Z dagger sigma Z, is dual to W dagger sigma ZW in the dual theory. Okay? And every local operator in this theory can be matched to a local operator in the other theory. Okay, so that's the first proposal. Okay, uh, this is something we had not even wildly dreamed of before, and it's something that uh, now we realize makes a lot of sense. Okay, uh, so you can ask how are symmetries realized in both sides of the theory? This theory, I said, microscopically, or rather, has a manifest. SO3 cross O2 symmetry, right? Uh, how are those symmetries realized here? And it turns out symmetries are not realized in any obvious manner, right? So neither theory, uh, this theory has an SO3 cross O2 symmetry, 
but it's not the same as O3 equals O2 symmetry as this theory. So neither theory cleanly realizes the symmetry of the other theory. Okay? So each theory only has manifest as O3 equals U1 symmetry, but the difference is O3 equals U1 symmetry on both sides, which means if duality is right, then even though neither theory has the same symmetry as the other theory, the final truth, the ultimate truth, must have the symmetries of both theories. Right? And the only symmetry assignment that's compatible with the symmetry of both theories is unify this SO3 and U1 into a hidden SO5 symmetry. Okay? And that's some identification of the five components of the nail or of the five component vector in both theories. Okay? So that's the appeal of this proposal of a self duality of this theory. So if we assume that is self dual, then we see that the fixed point, uh, the IR physics, must have an SO5 symmetry. Yeah, that's right, yeah. So that's the proposal, right? So we can explain the observed SO5 in the numerics if we assume the self duality. Okay? Now the converse statement is not true. The self duality, the, the this five in the numerics does not prove the self duality, okay? But it supports it. Right? If we had proposed the self duality and come up with some prediction that is not seen in the numerics, we would be very worried. But instead, what it leads to, the consequence, is something that is seen in the numerics, right? So that's the first uh, statement. Now the other check on this duality is to perturb both sides that are supposed that are claimed to be self-dual by the same operator, right? If this duality is indeed true, then the duality is true means that both theories flow to the same fixed point. If we perturb both sides by the same operator, then after that perturbation, the theory may be dual. Okay? Now in this case, it's interesting to perturb it by this operator, Z dagger sigma Z Z squared. Uh, which maps in the dual description to a similar operator. And after this perturbation, the manifest symmetry of either theory is reduced to O2 cross O2 instead of SO3 cross O2. Uh, and the self-duality of the original theory will then imply a self-duality of the perturbed theories. Okay? Now this self-duality it, it, it is a statement about a theory with O2 cross O2. And, and this is something for which we have the tools to check. We, we just need to use the old das gupta halperin duality uh, and apply it to each O2 factor and check whether the self-duality holds or not. Fortunately, this was done a long time ago by Lasik, Motrinich, and Ashwin Vishwanath. And uh, this self-duality of this perturbed theory has long been known to be a true statement. Right? So we land in the right place by assuming the self-duality of the fully SU2 symmetric theory. Right? Then we perturb it, you know, the various things that one can check all lead to sensible answers. Right? There's, there's confidence that perhaps the proposed duality is right. right? So that's the proposal. Right? Maybe it's wrong, but at least it's a clear state and testable consequences. Right? There's all kinds of consequences of phase diagram that one can write down. Okay, uh, now it turns out that this duality is just one member of an entire web of dualities that one can make a case for. All of them have the feature that if any one of them is true, then it implies this emergent SO5 symmetry at the critical point, right? Uh, uh, but so the other dualities are much, much more intriguing. Uh, so this theory this non-compact CP1 model, whose field content was one boson, uh, which uh, uh, transformed as a tablet and a, a global two symmetry and a dynamical U1 gauge field. Uh, it looks like a bosonic theory. Uh, now, we claim that this dual to a theory, which is a theory written in terms of fermions. The theory of QED3 in two dimensions, two, with two flavors, uh, massless QED3, that's coupled to a scalar field that gives a mass, a symmetric mass, 
uh, to, to these fermions. And assume that this field phi, which is a scalar field, is critical. Right? So this what's known as the gross node transition. So we assume that uh, if you tune this QED3 model coupled field to the, to the critical point where the scalar field is about to condense, that field theory, it's a well-defined field theory, that that field theory is dual in the infrared to this NCC. Now, furthermore, uh, based on that uh, this duality, uh, some work of it can be established using these new methods, uh, these new results on field theory dualities that have uh, uh, been discussed in the last couple of years. And those same methods lead us to a self-duality of this theory. So there's a bunch of field theories, right? Earlier, we only knew this description. Now we claim that the infrared physics of this theory can equivalently well described by a number of other field theories, where the field content, where the local operators of this theory uh, are represented in some highly non-trivial ways in each one of these other theories, okay? So what's the use of all this, right? It's some, if you're a field theorist, you say, oh, it's great. These weird theories are actually related to each other, right? But if you're a practical condensed matter person, it's what can you gain from all these things? Right? So what you can gain is that given the controversy surrounding NCCP1 numerically, you now have a new numerical handle addressing issues related to the fate that or fate of NCCP1. Right? So, so you, you could take this theory. Uh, this theory can be simulated without a sign problem. Right? So try to calculate, do numerics with this theory. And perhaps that gives you a different numerical handle on this issue of deconfined criticality. Is it too loud? No. All right. <laughs> Is it too loud? No. I have a loud voice. I usually don't like a microphone, but <laughs> apparently it's being recorded. <laughs> okay. Uh, so this new formulation gives you a new handle, uh, mainly numerical, but also analytical handle uh, uh, to address the fate of this theory that we've been interested in, right? That's one use of understanding, uh, of at least uh, having this possibility of various different theories being equivalent to each other. Uh, even, uh, and, and the other advantage, of course, is what I've already mentioned, that if, if any one of the dualities of this, if it's true, it implies emergent SO5 symmetry at the fixed point. Yeah. Uh, it depends uh, the identification, right? So the operator identification that, that this is here. So the monopole operator of this uh, gauge field, uh, it turns out it transforms uh, as four components of uh, the five component vector, as two components of the nail of the, the the x and y components of the nail vector and the VBS order parameter, and the fifth component, which is the z component of the nail vector is this phi field, okay? Uh, so if the duality is true, then all five components have to have the same critical behavior, okay? Self-duality implies that there's an SO4 symmetry, there's an O4 symmetry, and then uh, uh, this duality implies SO5 symmetry. Okay. Uh, now let's do something else. Let's continue this perturbation of the original theory by adding this uh, deformation that takes you, by adding this deformation, right? So this turns out to be an interesting model in its own right. Uh, uh, it makes the manifest continuous symmetry to O2 O2. Now in lattice models, uh, this corresponding field theory, it's known to describe two different kinds of phase transitions. Uh, that are both of intrinsic interest in current spandrel physics. One is uh, the nail to VB phase transitions in spin off uh, square lattice quantum magnets, where microscopically you only have XY spin symmetry, like an XXZ spin model or something. Uh, but a different kind of phase transition is also described by this theory, and this is a topological phase transition between an integer quantum Hall state of bosons. Uh, I've been sure a lot on that, and a trivial Morton Slater of bosons. 
that phase transition is also described by the same field theory. Okay? So this is a theory of interest in Kerensky matter physics. So we can ask what happens to these fermionic versions of the duality uh, once you have this easy plane deformation. Okay. So the duality web that one can uh, that the original duality web that I had with two symmetry, this leads to a duality web for the easy plane theory as well. Uh, it, it is self-dual. So this is the statement that we use as evidence for this duality in the first place, the C2 symmetric duality. That after this easy plane deformation, that it's still self, that it's still self-dual. This is the statement discussed by Nitsch and Vishwanath from 2004. Uh, but now we see that this has this in a certain kind of duality to QED3, and QED3 itself is self-dual with two flavors, and so on and so forth. And these statements. Uh, so this web of dualities, the consequence of the web of dualities that conjectured earlier, many members of this web have appeared an independent state in the recent literature based on this recent developments of two dualities of 2 plus 1D field theories. Uh, many papers just in the last one year uh, argue for various versions of these dualities. That being said, there's some care that's needed in the interpretation of this web of duality. Uh, in particular, it turns out there's some extra operators that are allowed in this theory, but not allowed in this theory. So it's not clear at this stage that a critical point in this theory, um, uh, that the, sorry, that the QED, the, the, the critical point that the conformally invariant fixed point, if it exists in QED3, corresponds to a critical point in this theory or to some sort of multi-critical point in that theory. Okay. Uh, so what we can do with enormous confidence, right? Uh, so the first part of the statement that I'm making here is basically proven, right? Uh, one can show that all these theories in this duality web have the same local operators, have the same symmetries, and we can match the phase diagrams, that they have the same phase diagram. They really describe the same underlying physical system. They have the same phase diagram. So we expect that all the phase transitions are described by the same theory. Right? What we do not know is whether the strong version of the conjecture, whether all these theories flow to the same uh, conformal fixed point, uh, which also describes, amongst other things, the nail to VBS phase transition. So if that statement is true, then uh, that co corresponding conformal fixed point has an O4 symmetry, which is something that new physics can again test. So this, so this understanding, which uh, 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 is a refinement of what's in all these papers, uh, uh, leads to many, many concrete predictions for numerics on QED3. That's a problem that lattice gauge people have been studying for a long time for other reasons. But now there's very concrete statements that we can make that are amenable to direct numerical tests. And that's something that would be very, very useful to do. And indeed, people are doing that as we speak. And the physical meaning of this O4 symmetry in the magnetism context is that it rotates the XY nail order parameter to the VBS order parameter. OK. Uh, these field theories that participate in this duality web. Each one of these field theories has been studied for a long time numerically, and there's many, many controversies within the numerical community on what they do. Uh, so we don't know the IR fate of these theories well, as things stand. Okay? Now, for the nail to VBS phase transition in, uh, with XY symmetry, the general thinking in the field in the last 10 years has been that that transition is first order. Even though with full SU2 symmetry, the general thinking was that that transition was second order. Okay? That was based on a number of numerical papers uh, spread out over nearly 10 years. But we think that this should be revisited in light of our new conceptual understanding of these theories. And just the last few weeks, there's two uh, calculations on different lattice models that, for the first time, see a second-order phase transition 
of the snail to VBS phase transition with XY symmetry. Now for QED3, uh, the two flavors, uh, this is a long-standing issue that people argue about. What's at large NF, it's known that it's the conformal fixed point. At small NF, it's expected or believed that the theory becomes massive and breaks what's known as chiral symmetry. Uh, people argue about the critical value of NF based on various uncontrolled approximations. The real way to test is to, is to numeric. Uh, the early numerics by various people, uh, Hans, Kogut, and so on, that uh, for at NF equals two, that you don't get a safe, that you end up with a symmetry broken face. Now, this has been revisited just last year by uh, uh, two other people, Kartik and Narayanan, Florida. And uh, uh, they do a different regularization of the Dirac fermion compared to the earlier calculation, something that enables implementing the SU2 symmetry more faithfully. Uh, for matter of people, what they really do is to realize this Dirac fermion surface, so it's a domain wall fermion, surface of some 3D topological insulator. Right? Uh, but this more recent numerics finds good support for infrared CFT of this NF equals 2 QED3. Okay? Uh, uh, so this more modern calculation seems to disagree with the other calculation. And for, for a good reason, they're using a better regularization of the Dirac fermion. Okay? So it's all controversial. And the role that du these dualities play is that, uh, first of all, it tells you that these two controversies are related. They may be the same controversy, right? which is good. <laughs> so you reduce the number of controversies in the field. Right? And second, uh, it leads to new numerical ways to address these issues. Right? In particular, we, uh, this duality, the self-duality of these two theories leads to a prediction that there's enlarged O4 symmetry. And that O4 symmetry is something that leads to very simple testable consequences in numerics. And that's something that Akat and Narayan and can easily test, and they've already tested some parts of it, and there's a paper where they do find some evidence for enlarged O4 symmetry. I believe they will do more tests as they go along. So there is some hope that some of these old controversies may act, can actually be settled, or at least you can make some progress in understanding them. How much do I have? There's no clock that I can see. I'm past, you should, you should have, the, but I can stop any time. The five minutes, okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, I, I'm happy to stop any time. So there's nothing that, there's no, that's not like, there's a course where I had to finish a syllabus before the exam, right? Uh, so let me very, very briefly tell you some things here. Uh, so you might be interested in a field theoretic formulation which has manifest as O5 symmetry, right? going back to fully SU2 symmetric case. Uh, now the punchline in the story, which we've understood now, is that the SO5 is realized anomalously in the same sense as quantum field theorists use the word anomaly, as an, a toothed anomaly in this theory. So it cannot be realized in a lattice model as an exact microscopic symmetry, but it can be real, viewed as the surface theory of a 3 plus 1 dimensional bosonic symmetry protected topological paramagnet. Uh, but there is a field, so then the question of whether you can construct some other field theory with the same anomaly, it turns out there's a very simple field theory, it's just QCD3, massless QCD3 with two flavors, or with two doublets of fermions. Okay, let me briefly indicate how this goes. Uh, so, you know, so we are proposing that there is some IR field theory, that, that there is a field theory which has an, an, an SO5 symmetry in the IR, right? Now once there's a symmetry, there's a global symmetry, it, you should be able to couple a gauge field, a background gauge field to that symmetry, right? If it's not anomalous, that should, you should be able to consistently couple a background gauge field, okay? So couple in a background SO5 gauge field, and let's study now, an SO5 gauge field in two plus one dimensions admits an instant on because uh, pi one of SO5 is Z2. Now, let's think about a particular regression where one component of the five gauge field 
usual monopole potential. Okay? Now that breaks this gauge field configuration breaks the SO5 symmetry down to SO3 cross SO2. Okay? Now what this instanton does is to create a vortex in two components of the SO5 vector. Okay? Now for this uh, non-complex CP1 model, we already saw that creating a vortex in two components of the five component vector produces a spin or in the remaining three components. Okay? So this object we see has zero SO2 charge, but it's an SO3 spin or. The fact that it transforms a spin or means that this anomaly and you know the spin or is, uh, cannot be a local operator in this theory. So the instanton is supposed to be a local operator, but we see that it can't be a local operator. So this normal is five symmetry. And it turns out it can be regularized at the boundary of a boson SPT. Uh, and this boson SPT, uh, 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 if you don't know what an SPT is, I won't explain it. <laughs> it's just for the two few people in the audience who know what this is. Uh, it's possible to construct such a boson, bosonic state with the property that its response to a background gauge field is characterized by a theta term, but it's a particular theta term, it's a discrete theta term, unlike the standard FGF, which was introduced in the high energy literature just a few years back. It's what's known as a discrete theta term, and this modifies the bulk SO5 monopole in precisely the right way to match the known instanton structure boundary. Right? Uh, okay, uh, so let me conclude with this story. Uh, so actually, let me just skip this. Um, uh, so the statement is that this theory, uh, massless fermionic QCD3 with two doublets uh, that transform uh, two species of fermions, each of which is a doublet under SU2, has the same, has A, manifest SO5 symmetry, and B, the SO5 symmetry is anomalous in exactly the right way for it to match the Degenfein critical point. So this is then an alternate formulation of the nail to VBS competition, and perhaps it can be tuned uh, to have, uh, uh, you know, to have manifested so far cross T symmetry. There's a number of things that you can show, but uh, the most useful thing is that this is another thing that can be simulated without a problem. So maybe this gives you yet another way to numerically attack this question of this nail to VBS competition. That's, uh, yeah. Can I just finish with this? Uh, I'm sorry if I lost all the students in the room. <laughs> I didn't know what audience was speaking to, so I just made a field theory talk. <laughs> uh, But if you remember, I said that if I postulate based on the numerics, if you slept through most of the talk, but you remember the slide about what is the fate of the nail to VBS transition, I said, look, it looks second order. It looks like it has emerged in SO5 symmetry. But this conformal bootstrap people tell us that such a conformal field theory doesn't exist. So how are we going to resolve that tension? All these dualities don't help you for that. right? Uh, and what, what is the meaning of dualities? Is this ultimately no conformal field theory in the infrared? Right? So a possible resolution is that the current numerics is not really approaching the true asymptotic physics. You can always say that, right? Even though the lattice size is huge by any standards, right? 500 by 500. But then, if it's not approaching the true asymptotic physics, why do you see scaling at all? Where do you see exponents, even if they drift? Where do you see exponents? Why is the physics universal? In different lattice models right, give the same answer. Right? If it's not yet in the reaching the fixed point, what's going on? Right? And why, why do all of them have the same drifts? Right? So we came up with a wild idea, which I think is uh, quite excited by, uh, that perhaps a, a, this observed enhanced symmetry and scaling are happening because, because the RG4 takes you close to a fixed point but ultimately goes away, and the fixed point is really in the unitary axis. Fixed point is slightly off the unitary axis. Right? Uh, and this, so if that happens, then large interval landscape 
in which system uh, looks like it's flowing towards a fixed point, right? It's, got, it's trying to go towards this fixed point, but it can never hit the fixed point where the fixed point is this, it's not described by any unitary quantum field theory, right? No, there's no unitary Hamiltonian. There's some coupling constant that's supposed to be real has, at the fixed point, it's slightly imaginary. So on the real axis, you can only get that close. Right? Now, if that's the case, then you will have some universality and some scaling, but eventually you lose the scaling and you'll drift off somewhere else. Right? And this phenomenon is known to happen in two dimensions in the five-state Potts model. The, five, the 2D, five, the classical five-state Potts model has a first-order phase transition, uh, but the correlation length is 2,000 the spacing. Okay. <laughs> it's, and this was understood by, among, by many people, amongst others, John Cordy, who's somewhere in this building, lo a long time back. By doing an epsilon expansion around Q equals 4, the four-state Potts model is a well-known conformal field theory. So you can do a Q minus 4 expansion. And the Q minus 4 expansion, you see that the, the coupling constant, uh, which has a beta function such so that there's a fixed point with this, where at the fixed point, the coupling constant is slightly imaginary. Okay? So then you can calculate the correlation length that it's exponentially large in, in what the square root of Q minus 4. And the p-factors work out in such a way that you get this humongously big correlation length. Right? So it's a known phenomenon in 2D classical statmic models. So we, it's known as pseudo-criticality. So we call this quantum pseudo-criticality. And if this is what's going on, then all dualities and so on describe the physics up to this very large length scale uh, where the system is approaching this non-unitary fixed point before eventually going off to wherever it wants to go. Where it ultimately ends up, we don't know. Maybe it's a CFT with totally different exponents. Maybe it's first order transition and so on and so forth. Anyway, so there's a lot of progress on this old problem. And there's many new predictions for testing these dualities. Uh, from field theory point of view, there's been many new dualities that have been proposed, conjectured in the last two years, uh, but there's very few really concrete calculational tests, and it has to be numerically. No magic trick with uh, supersymmetric localization, blah, 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 you can do. You have to do the hard numerical work. But for that, we need to know what numerics to do and what predictions the dualities make for the numerics. So, so I think we have very many, many, many concrete predictions and hopefully some of these dualities will be tested. So this quantum pseudo-criticality I think is a cool thing to contemplate. We have a, a weird system that's showing scaling in some intermediate temperature re regime but ultimately fails to go to a critical point. Right? There's lots of such systems. Most metals are, that show strange non fermi liquid physics, at low temperature, they'll do something ordinary. They'll right? become a superconductor, become something else. So maybe that's what's going on. OK, let me stop there. Right, so that, that there's some accident involved there. That, uh, that distance has to be small. So the five-state Potts model, that number is one. Right? But the, no, no, the fixed point is at some fixed value of the coupling constant, right? It's at some fixed value. And lattice models are, in a physical model, are constrained to flow on this axis, right? So you have no guarantee that this distance is small, but if it happens to be small, right, then you will get scaling for, and universality over a wide intermediate but not infinite range, right? No. It's just a different model, so perhaps it'll give you access to some questions more easily. I have no, yeah. There is, the epsilon expansion is very poorly behaved. Uh, in the epsilon expansion, the transition is, there's runaway flows to strong coupling, and it looks like it's first order, right? Unless the number of uh, boson flavors is bigger than 180 or some such number. Maybe it's 365. It's closely related to days in a year. <laughs> so the point is, there's a field theory for which the epsilon expansion 
it's not directly useful. Right? The log n expansion gives you a second order. So for the standardizing model, epsilon and log n give the same qualitative picture. Here they give you different answers. Right? So yeah, you have to do something else. Yeah, I bet the, the, there are similar dualities, but they're bound to be more complicated. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, uh, the one thing that we've learned is that uh, almost everything now has in uh, one d every interest CFT probably has some kind of dual description. Uh, in fact, in many, many dual descriptions. Uh, but how useful they are depends. Right? Yeah, that's right. The, uh, uh, in this five state ports example, what ends up happening is that um, so there is some coupling constant which has an RG flow which looks like this, uh, you know, epsilon plus lambda squared, right? So in the fixed, there's two fixed points at plus minus i square root epsilon, right? Um, no, no, the domains can be of any size, right? but you have the domain wall. And here I'm taking a complete classical picture of the valence bond solid state where the domain wall has, is infinitesimal 10. Right? You, you could, and you, you could, you know, fluctuate or you could coarsen all that a bit, but that's the basic 